and I'm hoping that that's now worked. So yeah, that works. What we have in front of us here is um, this is uh, more, um, as, as Christian said, telenovelas. This uh, this I think is from HBO's Rome series. Um, I personally prefer the I Claudius from years gone by, but then I'm, as you can see, pretty aged, so that's perhaps no surprise. But here we can see the youthful Octavian um, surrounded by his soldiers. We could moan about the uniforms HBO have put on there, but that's not really what we're up to today. But let's think about the emperor and his army. So here's my campaign to link heavy metal with ancient history. I purchased this album um, by singer Ronnie James Dio when I was an undergraduate. And, and I think here there is a profound truth about the reign of Augustus. Uh, one of the lines in one of his songs goes, beneath the velvet lies, there's a truth as hard as steel. And that truth, of course, is that to be emperor, you have to command the army. Uh, there's the advice at the bottom of the screen of a later emperor, Septimius Severus, as he lay dying in York, of all places. He turned to his two sons and he said, stick together, pay the troops, ignore everyone else. There's the quotation from Cassius Dio. And as you can see, Severus was as good as his word. There's a coin of Severus. And on the back of the coin, we can see a legionary eagle and associated regimental standards. Uh, certainly for Severus, the army is what makes the ruler. And I think that's true throughout the imperial period from the very beginning. And here's part of that truth that's as hard as steel. The opening words of the race Gestae. At the age of 19, on my own initiative and at my own expense, I raised an army through which I rescued the Republic, uh, which had been oppressed by the tyranny of a faction. Of course, you could turn that round, couldn't you, if you wanted to be a little bit less um, positive about Augustus and say the bloke uh, hired an army and he launched a coup d'etat. Um, what I've got on the screen in front of you now are the Athol Highlanders. Europe's only private army. Uh, this is the army of the head of the Murray clan in Scotland. They're allowed to carry these rifles and drill. Uh, it's the only place that's the case. What I'm going to suggest to you is that actually what the emperor didn't do was remove the warlords from Roman politics, but made sure he was the only warlord, that the army is a personal army, really not an army of the state. Well, um, in Ronnie James Dio's little songs, he also talks about there being a never ending wheel. And the never ending wheel from the late Republic, of course, is this way that generals bribed their soldiers. The soldiers then demanded more bribes out of them. And there is a cycle, e really, ever since the collapse of um, <coughs> the Gracchi, of civil war driven by generals and their armies and maybe we can see that sort of thing is still around at the beginning of octavian's career uh, here's an edict found in egypt um, those of you who don't know bgu is just a collection of papyri um, based in berlin which is what the b stands for there and fira is just a source of um, roman law documents but there's this edict which gives a whole series of exemptions to the veterans of Octavian's own army and you can see they're quite good ones you're not going to be taxed you can vote in which tribe you want to and that could give you more political leverage uh, than other people um, you don't have to go on the council and that involves a lot of expense in antiquity you don't get soldiers billeted on you all of that I think is really quite important and also important perhaps is the way that Augustus styles himself on that document Imperator Kaiser Dewey Filius, and this is a line that is pushed very hard at the beginning of the man's career. So famously, of course, Mark Antony contemptuously said of Octavian, you boy who owe everything to a name, and that's in the Philippics, there's the quotation for you. And of course, the name is Caesar. We should remember that on this of all days, of course. And we can see that Stressed here again early in Octavian's career. This is a coin from France. It's a provincial coin from near Lyon. Copia is a little village actually just outside of Lyon. Um, and there's the name for us 
Imperator, Kaiser, and then you can see, I hope, the legend rolling from beneath the two busts round to the right and upwards. We can see Dewey and then I for Yuli, Yuli later on. Um, and there's Octavian, and there's Julius Caesar, and there's a Victor's palm. And the central word, interestingly, isn't Caesar, is it there? But in fact, it's imp for imperator. What was Caesar famous for? He was famous for being a great general. And that's the bit that Octavian latches onto. That's the bit that attracts the soldiers he'll need if his bid for power is going to succeed. <coughs> and the word is pleasingly uh, ambiguous in a way. Of course, it is the word we get our English word emperor from. So again, you can see this stress on military prowess is really very important indeed. It can just mean general. And my top coin there, you can see Imperator, Imp, just behind the head of Octavian, Caesar in front, then Augustus, Dewey, Felius, underneath. But of course, very often Roman generals were hailed as victorious emperors on the field of battle by their troops. So Imperator also carries this idea of victory with it. And here you can see my bottom coin gets that into the nexus as well. So now we've got Augustus Dewey Felius on the front of the coin. Uh, there's our butting bull on the back still, but now it says imp, but it says imp 10. Hailed victorious general, 10 pounds. So this is a very important and quite usefully flexible way of using this word. Now then, uh, again, people will think about this perhaps from recent times. Uh, how do you break this never ending wheel of successions of warlords? What did Octavian need to do to stop him being just another in a succession of temporary rulers? Well, the most important thing was to make sure there could never be another warlord. And we'll be having a look at how he went about that in a few moments. One most very important thing, of course, is to convince everyone he's a great commander. He's a man to whom you can entrust the state and you will be safe. And who knows, the state may grow. To do all of that, you need an army. Octavian, as we'll see, inherits an enormous one. The state can't afford an enormous army. So there's a balancing act here. You've got to shrink the army, but obviously not so much to place your state in danger and also you hopefully have enough soldiers to push it out a little bit as well and then finally by dominating the army you take it out of politics you make it your army and they make sure that there can be no challenges to that from other subordinate commanders so these are the ways i think that octavian tries to shatter this wheel of civil wars driven by angry soldiers, which has been going on for the best part of a hundred years in Rome. Well, here's the stress on victory. And I've used coins. I've also, of course, used that most famous of all statues of Augustus, the Prima Porta statue, which is absolutely riddled with symbolism about what a great general um, Augustus was. And if people want to explore that more, uh, on our departmental website, we have a little section of revision lectures about various aspects which will fit to your A-level curriculum. And there's one on the Prima Porta statue. So if you want to explore that, there's a place to go for. You can see that the pose is copied on coins. Look at the one Caesar, Dewey Felius at the bottom there. But then this hammering of the achievements, the military achievements of Augustus. The left-hand column of coins, we can see the capture of Egypt, the defeat of the Armenians, the triumph in the north of Spain in Cantabria and Asturias. And then, of course, most importantly of all, and again on the Prima Porta statue, that re recovery of standards from the Parthians, done diplomatically, but of course the iconography that fi is fired around the empire is very much to imply that this was a military victory. So there we've got a groveling Parthian there, 
And the middle one is actually a coin struck in Pergamum, in the east of the empire. So these things are not just pushed around in Rome. They're pushed everywhere. The triumphal arch erected for this triumph. And you can see Signis Recaptis, our standards got back there underneath the arch. And there's Mars Altor at the bottom, that centerpiece of Augustus's home forum, where in the end those statues were placed. So this very, very strong stress on conquest and triumph. And of course, we get that in the race gesti as well. The race gesti is a CV of conquest. Here's a bit from chapter 26. I extended the boundaries of all the provinces, ah, which were bordered by races not yet subject to our empire. So not a bit of expansion, tons of expansion. And then all the way across the world, you see the great list here, um, they bounded by the ocean from Cadiz right down in the south in Spain up to the mouth of the Elbe. I reduced to a state of peace and on my orders. And this is an important phrase we'll come on to in a sec. Under my auspices, two armies go into Ethiopia and to, into Arabia with great success as well. So again, pushing out into the unknown. This man is the greatest conqueror Rome has ever seen. That's what the CV wants you to believe. And while we're doing that, we want to make sure that no one can challenge it. So one of the interesting things that happens in the imperial period is that Roman aristocrats stop having conquering names. The most famous, of course, from the Republic is Scipio Africanus, Scipio, the conqueror of the Africans. But we've also got people called Macedonicus, conqueror of Macedon and all sorts of other things. All of that stops in the imperial period. The only people who get conquering names are people directly who are part of the imperial family. People, of course, like Germanicus, uh, the conqueror of the Germans, um, named for the achievements of Drusus, who was the brother of Tiberius, so intimately linked into the imperial family. Now, again, early in Augustus's rule, uh, a man called Licinius Crassus um, went out and fought um, some uh, enemy tribes and he actually killed the commander the king of this tribe the Bastane, with his own hands now that qualified him technically for the best triumph you could ever get in rome it only ever ha happened twice um and one of those was mythical um that would have trumped augustus something rotten strangely augustus discovered that <coughs> the men who had done this in the past had always been the top general. They'd never been a deputy, even a commander in the field who was a deputy, but they would had their own auspices. And through that little bit of political archaeology, which we find in Livy and in Dio, Licinius Crassus was disqualified from getting this super triumph in 29 BC and soon fades from the political scene. Funny that. Then again, Cornelius Gallus, um, the man who had led those expeditions that the race Gestae boasts on, boasts of, into Egypt. He too started to set up rather too many statues praising himself rather than his emperor. And his fall was rapid. And indeed, in the end, it seems that he committed suicide before he was going to be dragged into a show trial. So very, very careful policing of military prowess to make sure that the emperor can never be overshadowed in this the most vital of all roman political institutions and of course the most visible form of that is the triumph in rome itself where you parade up to the capitoline hill to give thanks for your victory it very much is showing you are the great man of the moment once again those triumphs rapidly become reserved to the imperial family itself. No one outside the imperial family gets them. The last person who did is the chap who's surrounded by the fountain here. He's a denizen of Cadiz, of all places, and um, local, uh, locals are very proud of him. Um, Cornelius Balbus the Younger. Uh, and he, of course, like his father, had been great friends of Caesar and Caesar's extended family. So once again, even that last triumph outside um, the family is almost inside the family. Very careful policing. Now, you still have the problem of a very big army. At the end of 
the campaigns culminating in the Battle of Actium, when Octavian has won, he's got over 50 legions. He simply can't afford to pay that many soldiers. Some of them are going to have to be got rid of. And as you can see, what the emperor does is he reduces the number of troops he's got by about half. 28 to start with, and then after the great disaster in Germany at Teutoburgerwald in 9 AD, um, three legions go down there, they are not replaced. It falls down to 25. How do you get round that? Well, you can't just discharge these soldiers because they're going to be angry. They're going to want land, they're going to want money to, as reward for what they did. And Augustus gives them that. He pays them off and he settles them in colonies. And do remember that in our period, the word colony means a city, not a large area. And he pays for all of this personally. Again, tying the soldiers and the ex-soldiers, the veterans to him is a very important part of his strategy. Here's a coin from Cordoba in the south of Spain. Um, you can see the word col at the top, colonia running round the coin. There's the legionary eagle. Uh, she's one of the place Augustus puts these people. And again, I think the position of those colonies is really interesting. Loads of them wind up in the so-called senatorial areas of the empire, the south of Spain, the North African coast, bits of Asia. And there, of course, Augustus, with his great settlements, which no doubt you've been learning about, um, uh, is a little bit more hands off about running the empire. It's very useful, to, therefore, to have lots of former soldiers, all of whom will still be of an age where they can be quite handy and able to fight if they have to, knowing that they've got these lovely benefits from the emperor sitting in those areas. Any governor around there wants to try and cause any trouble. He may well have trouble of his own from these veterans who are loyal to the emperor. And the race guest die again hammers home the amount of money that was spent on veteran soldiers. And what I've done on this screen is I've stressed all the first person singulars in this. It's not the Roman state that's done this. It's not that Octavian has arranged the Roman state to do this. He very firmly says, I did this. I paid for this. This is all down to me. I'm the person who set up the new treasury, which is going to help pay veterans all the time. My advice, it was my idea. It's my money. Be grateful to me. This, I will look after you if you're a soldier. And again, perhaps this ties in a lot with some of the things Mary was saying about the way that groups are cultivated. We talk about a military contract nowadays, don't we, in the uh, modern world? Here's an example from Cassius Dio. Um, here's a soldier who fought with Octavian and he wants him to come and be his witness in court. And first he can't be bothered with this wretched squaddy, you know. And, and then the bloke turns round and he says, well, hang on a minute. When you needed my help, I didn't send my friend or substitute. I came and I fought for you. And then the emperor penny drops, if you like, and he goes to court. Now, Dayu, of course, is writing a long time after these events. And this is quite possibly what you might call a publicly sanctioned rumour. Uh, we have them today, don't we? I can remember um, a long time ago now, uh, there was a rumour that the Queen had views about a penalty awarded against England in the World Cup. Well, I don't know if she ever watched that game, but it's a good thing for her to say. And that sort of thing is spread, spreads out through a PR system. This could be that sort of thing. Interestingly, Dio gives this as an example of what he calls the emperor behaving democratically. In other words, with an eye to the people. And that, I think, is quite nice when we tie it together with some of the things Mary was saying about the way um, civilian plebs were also cultivated by the emperor. But also, as Mary pointed out, um, the emperor could be tough. The emperor is a father to his soldiers. He's not a brother. He's still less like the warlords of the Republic, a servant. So as you can see, according to Suetonius, when the civil wars are finished, we, know, we aren't pally with soldiers anymore. We don't go and call them co-militones, my fellow soldiers. We simply call them soldiers because I'm the commander. 
and he stops his family behaving in this familiar way as well. He thinks it's too flattering, too ambitious um, for um, commanders to speak to their troops like that, and it's not good for discipline. So once again, we've got that idea of tough love. I will look after you, but I'm in charge, and remember that. Now, another thing that Augustus does, which I think is really important for us, is the way that the army is actually configured. Now, the great settlement of 27 BC effectively made Augustus the de facto commander of virtually the whole Roman army. He gets that enormous province, remember, and in it are just happen to be most of the legions of the Roman state. And because technically he's the commander, he then gets personally to appoint provincial governors and legionary commanders. That's why they're called legates. Lego in Latin means I choose, a legatus is a chosen man. And no one can moan, of course, because Pompey did this in the Republic when he had his big command to clear the Mediterranean of pirates. He had legates as well, so no one can say this is tyrannical or anything like that. So every person who is appointed has a debt of gratitude to the emperor. They're not there because they're good, they're there because the emperors picked them, and that's the bottom line. And interestingly, it's also true of centurions. They all get their commission, so to speak, from the emperor. You don't deserve it. It's a favour. You are obliged to look favourably on someone who's done you a favour. Moreover, these people only serve a very short period of time before moving on, and they tend to bounce from military jobs to civilian jobs to military jobs. There is no officer corps to be able to plot and launch a coup. Now, was that planned? Maybe it was. But of course, we re we've got to remember that Roman aristocrats wouldn't have wanted a job. So perhaps here we could say the social fabric of Roman society actually helped the Emperor Augustus create this amateur officer corps, which took away the danger of a coup. He may have given it a helping hand, perhaps, but arguably it didn't even occur to him. It was just Roman social fabric turned out in this rather useful way for him. Now, of course, the difference is we have an amateur officer corps, but we have professional other ranks. And as we'll see, this isn't a threat to the emperor. It's in fact a benefit to him. There's now, for the first time, a proper career structure for soldiers. The soldiers know they will be paid regularly. They know at the end of their service, there will be either a cash bonus or a grant of land. And they are forced to save in a compulsory fashion. And that's a smart move from the emperor, isn't it? The last thing you want is these people would have joined up at about 18. They'd have come out at about 40. They'd still be handy with weapons. If they've got no money, they might think revolution or banditry would be a really good career choice. Uh, this way, by giving them savings and such like, we can create stability in society. And all of that comes with a message, a very strong message, as to who is providing all of this lovely stuff. <coughs> Here's a little known emperor, he did pretty well actually, 14 years, Alexander Severus, and here's a voice that he says, and I think probably the voice from the future, he's held up as a great emperor by his biographer, that he's mirroring what Augustus would have said as well. A soldier is not to be feared if he's clothed, armed, shod, has a full stomach and something in his wallet. Um, and that's what the emperor provides, and he makes sure that the soldiers know it's him who's providing it. So, the sacramentum, the oath of loyalty. Every year on the day the current emperor came to power, the soldiers parade out and they take an oath of loyalty to him. And it's to him personally. Our best evidence for that comes from Pliny. One of his letters as he writes back to Trajan, confirming that this has happened. But if you go further east to Duro Europus in Syria, there's a military calendar survived there, called something called the Feriale Duranum. Um, you can find that on the internet on a site called Tertullian.org if you want to. And you can see the list of celebrations for the emperor. His immediate family's birthday gets celebrations. Great victories of approved emperors in the past get celebrations. Their 
big thrust is to link the army immediately to the house of the Caesars. And we even have a version of the oath that they swore. And you can see there from Vegetius, the soldiers swear they shall faithfully execute all that the emperor commands, etc., etc. By the way, that's the only surviving Roman shield we have, and it comes from Dura Europus, which I thought I'd just put it in because I've been talking about it briefly here. And we all know about Legion of the Eagles, but in our period, there's a new standard to go with the eagle, the imago or the image. Whose image is it? It's the image of the current emperor. Here's a reenactor parading one around, and I think you can probably work out that's actually a bust of the Emperor Vespasian. If you want to see an actual figure of this, go down the road when it reopens to Chester, and there you can see Aurelius Diogenes and Imaginifer, the carrier of the Imago, are stone rather badly damaged, but there you can see, I think, the bust on the top of the standard. That standard is as revered as the eagle. Again, it ties the army personally to the emperor. And that career could go a long way if you're a soldier. So you start as an ordinary soldier, a Miles Gregarius, a soldier of the herd. Then you can get led off fatigues and immunis. Then you can become somebody like the watchword man or the trumpeteer, a principalis, optio, a deputy centurion, a centurion, and then rising right up through the ranks to the first centurion of the legion, a man who's got a pay packet, which is good enough to take you into the equestrian order. You could go a very, very long way. Here's my analogy from the early 20th century. This is Sir William Robertson. Sir William Robertson enlisted as a lancer, an ordinary trooper from a not particularly well off family in Lincolnshire at the end of the 19th century. When he retired in 1920, he was field marshal. You could go all the way. Of course, your chances of doing so were not particularly high, but then the lottery is like that too. If you go and buy a lottery ticket, you've more chance of being killed by a lightning bolt while going to get it. But that still doesn't stop a lot of people thinking it could be me. So that ladder of opportunity, that career structure is there put in place by the emperor. My thing on the side there you can see is a tombstone a chap called Sitius Flaccus and he was a first he was a first centurion PP stands for Primus Pillus he goes on to be the commander of the 10th cohort of the Praetorian Guard he did okay for himself and again I think the soldiers were grateful for this sort of career structure that's out there and of course the payoff was that there was loyalty um, the Roman army orientates itself to the emperors. At the, the death of the Emperor Augustus, there's a big mutiny in the Roman army. And it's led by these two ne'er-do-wells, Pecenius and Vibulanus. And then in the end, the loyalists go around and say, look, are we really going to swear to them? Are they going to pay us? Are they going to give us land? What's in it for us to go with Pecenius and Vibulanus? Absolutely nothing. Whereas with the emperor... There's stuff, and that stuff matters. It engenders the loyalty. Of course, let's just think a little bit about notorious soldiers, the Praetorian Guard. Again, just like having legates, Republican generals had Praetorian soldiers to guard them. It's a good old Republican institution. You can't complain about it. Of course, they're the only soldiers in Italy. So the emperor's bodyguard are the only soldiers anywhere near the levers of power, which is very useful if you're the emperor. Again, you can say I'm not militarizing Italy. Um, there are only nine cohorts. Of course, each cohort was a thousand men, not 480 men. So actually it was nearly like two legions. But, you know, sometimes playing with words, as we all know, with politics can matter. In this period, and this is something which goes wrong, I think, later on for later emperors, but Augustus is no fool. There are, isn't one commander of this unit, there are two. So that no person can potentially launch a coup. There's always somebody to keep an eye on somebody else. Actually, Augustus is careful. There are only ever three cohorts of the Praetorian Guard in his rule, present in Rome. 
and although they're armed they swan around in civilian clothes so uh, you know the velvet lie there is very very firm the truth that's as hard as steel is that the emperor is the commander of the army and he can control things with armed force if he has to but that's modified and mollified to make it look much more civilized than all of that of course later on the big mistake is tiberius where we get one commander of the guard we get all of the guard in a big barracks outside of rome and that person becomes rather dangerous to the empress but augustus has managed things a bit better than that even so he was a bit jumpy and there is ironically a bodyguard against the bodyguard and these lads in fact were germans they weren't even romans on the grounds that german tribesmen were known for having a fanatical loyalty towards their chief so there is a bodyguard and then there is if you like an inner bodyguard as well well let's just think about one thing to finish with um when augustus died as many of you will know um the emperor tiberius as he was now brought out his last will and testament and it lists the armies of the roman empire and it also asked, adds this advice that the empire should be kept inside its present limits and then tastus who can never resist a chance at having a jab at imperial power says whether he did this out of fear he was scared that any more expeditions would cause uh, trouble for the romans or out of jealousy having built up as we've seen with the race gestae this cv of being rome's greatest conqueror ever he didn't want that ever to be occluded is an interesting question and of course it's linked with that enormous defeat towards the very end of augustus's reign the, the massacre in the tutor burgerwald where rome loses about 10 percent of her entire military strength something of course rightly if you're a german celebrated by the germans and here is the hermann denksmal um, the great monument erected in the 19th century to celebrate Arminius's defeat of the Romans. Uh, so did actually Augustus's policing of the army lead to a change in foreign policy, a change in the dynamics of the Roman Empire? When we sit back and look at the man, though, I think we can say that he was a tremendous success in this respect. Um, if we think about <coughs> the run of the political organization we know as the Principate, it lasts for over 250 years. In that time, there are only two significant civil wars, and they're really quite short. Um, there's one in 69-70, and there's one at the very end of the second century. If you run the stats on all of that, that's a 98% success rate. So we can leave our emperor as imperator kaiser there he is again on our coin um and we can say that the way he used the army did bring peace on the back of the coin there to the roman empire um some people might say peace at a certain price but nonetheless i think we can't but admire the way he managed this very tricky uh, problem he certainly broke the wheel the wheel was put back together again in the third century AD. But by and large, I think we can't say that this man was a failure in his military policies. So I'll call it a day there. I hope some of that has been of interest. Thank you so much, Andy. Well, we already have a, uh, a question. Um, is it true Augustus, Augustus did not personally uh, possess the military prowess of Julius Caesar and Marcus Agrippa? Oh, I think very much so, yes. Um, this, this is a man who, who tries very hard. Um, he has a few little campaigns in the Balkans. Then he tries to get on the back of a big campaign in Spain. So um, it looks like um, the areas of Spain called Asturias and Cantabria, um, so the area around Santander on the Bay of Biscay, that northern coast, are ripe for the taking. Uh, he goes there in person in 26 BC, and the wars get that little bit too hard for him, and he conveniently finds himself ill, and he sort of retreats out of them. Later he takes the credit, but he gets out because it's not going the way he wanted it to. So I think, yes, he, he's, he's got a problem. And that's why the propaganda hammers so hard 
After all, we all know that good propaganda, you get a simple lie and you keep pushing it and pushing it and pushing it. And one of those lies is that this man is a great military genius. And we have another couple of questions just here at the in the very last minute. Uh, can we draw parallels with the Roman legions uh, with that of the People's Liberation Army of China, as this is the army of the ruling party and not the state? Um, I think the answer is, I mean, again, of course, uh, the PLA and other armies of this sort um, would say they were the army of the state. And I think that's what Augustus wants us to see. But the great emphasis on the cult of personality, not just of him, but of all emperors, the imago, the personal appointments of all officers, the great stress on the emperor, and later on, of course, the emperor's wife. So um, Septimius Severus's uh, wife, for example, its official title is Mater Castrorum, um, the mother of the camps, in other words, the mother of the soldiers. So I think the, the idea that you've got there is quite a good one at the end of the day. I'm not sure, again, people will want to have it quite as in your face as blandly stating that, but the implications of what's, what are being done are clear. Uh, would you say that without Agrippa, Augustus would have been a far less successful emperor, and if Tiberius had an Agrippa, he would have been closer to the success of Augustus? Um, I think probably without Agrippa, Augustus wouldn't have been emperor. Um, Agrippa is the guy who wins the victories. Actually, he's the guy who turns Spain round when it's going very, very badly wrong at the end as well. The joy, of course, is that Agrippa is a man who can't be emperor. He's so de classe, no one's going to have an emperor called Sanius, um, that Augustus uh, can lord him to the skies because it's a harmless thing to do. It's a giveaway. Uh, had, Agri had Tiberius had an Agrippa, would he have been close to the success of Augustus? Let's remember, Tiberius was a great general. Um, load of success in the Balkans, load of success in Germany when fighting under Augustus or in Augustus's reign. Um, I think his management of the frontiers is smart and successful. I'm perhaps a little bit biased. Tiberius is one of my favourite emperors. I would say he was as at least as successful as Augustus. But that's something we can have arguments about in the future, maybe. Uh, how much credit can be given uh, Augustus for the uh, civil wars compared to Agrippa or Julius Caesar? Uh, in terms, I think, in terms of managing them politically, probably a great deal. I think uh, Octavian Augustus is a consummate politician. On the field of battle, not so much. Uh, notoriously, when Antony and Augustus are on the same side, uh, Antony does all the fighting and Augustus are arguably, so come some of the darker things, cowers in his tent. I mean, he doesn't want to go anywhere near the battlefield at all. Um, so in terms of um, military success, I think, um, you know, the great leaders, they say, aren't they, are good delegators. Um, Augustus knows who his great generals are. He also sees that his great generals, by and large, cannot threaten him politically. So he lets them get on with the military stuff. And then he manages the politics on the other side. Fantastic. I think we have just one last question, a quick one, I think. Uh, Greatest Dio, Cassius or Ronnie? Oh, Ronnie. Buy, buy, no, no, buy the album. and Buy all the albums. Uh, fantastic. And the stuff went down for Rainbow as well. 